So good morning. Uh, I'm very excited to be good here. Good afternoon. And thank you. It's because of this truth that, uh, that, that I'm here today uh, and, and found something that really has made my life worthwhile for me. And uh, it was refreshing to hear it again. Uh, it's, it's kind of funny when I find myself in a situation like this. Uh, you know, I, I kind of think of Swami Vivekananda when he was stand, sitting at the Parliament of Religions and uh, he was probably looking out on a sea of white faces as the only Hindu as he said, brothers and or sisters and brothers of America, and gave himself over to the truth that he uh, that he lived for and shared it with this country and with the Western world. And uh, I always uh, this is like the third or fourth time that I've been put in a situation by mother where I, I can almost hear her giggling at uh, at her delight at pranking me and uh, <laughs> you know having me kind of work uh, frantically um, with my own insecurities and my own wonder at, at how is it that the uh, events of my life have led to a situation like this to where I would be standing in front of you uh, and to, to say something about Hinduism uh, or about Swami Vivekananda. So uh, <laughs> with, that, uh, with that task at hand, I just kind of uh, jump in and, and go forward. When Swami Vivekananda came to this country, uh, he said that there were two things that uh, he felt the West needed from India. Two great teachings. In the first one, he said, therefore the world is waiting for this grand idea of universal toleration. It will be a great acquisition to civilization. Nay, no civilization can long exist unless this idea enters into it. No civilization can grow unless fanatics, bloodshed, and brutality stop. No civilization can begin to lift up its head until we look charitably upon one another. And the first step toward that much needed charity is to look charitably and kindly upon the religious convictions of others. Hindus have built and are still building churches for Christians, mosques for Mohammedans. That is the thing to do. In spite of their hatred, in spite of their brutality, in spite of their cruelty, in spite of their tyranny, and in spite of the vile language they are given to uttering, we will and must go on, building churches for the Christians, mosques for the Mohammedans, until we conquer through love, until we have demonstrated to the world that love alone is the fittest thing to survive and not hatred, that it is gentleness that has the strength to live on and to fructify and not mere brutality or physical force. That was his first priority, to tell that not just a toleration, not just, not just saying it's okay for you to be Christian, not okay for you to be uh, Islamic, not just okay for you to be Buddhist, but to honor at the very fundamental level the truth of what you're practicing. Hinduism is in a very unique and beautiful position of having no boundaries of its own, except the ignorance of us as its practitioners. <laughs> That's our only boundary. I delight in this tradition because it has taught me to have that natural and sincere respect for everyone. That I don't have to look at some people as sinners, I don't have to look at some people as knowing the truth, I don't have to look at some people as fools, I don't have to look at some people as evil, that I can look and see the divine first. That was the charm, that is the charm, of Hinduism to me and to the world and to and in my hope to my country and, and to, the, to, to Western philosophy. To have that fundamental idea that the divine exists in me and the divine exists in you and that we can recognize that first and always start from that place of togetherness, that, that, that place of friendship as we go forward and, 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 and build whatever we build from that. His second idea he says, the other great idea that the world wants from us today, the thinking part of Europe, nay, the whole world, is that eternal grand idea of the spiritual oneness of the whole universe. I need not tell you, men from Madras University, how the modern researches of the West have demonstrated through physical means the oneness and the solidarity of the whole universe. He goes on to say that the real soul is one, 
None can regenerate this land of ours without the practical application and effective operation of this ideal of the oneness of things. So to see that in each other, you know, I always talk about the, the proverbial Starbucks uh, barrister, you know, sits there, makes that cup of coffee for you. And it's one of the most mundane interactions of a day to sit there and order your cup of coffee across the counter. And uh, how many times have we done that? And when I first heard this idea of the oneness of things, when I first ran into this beautiful character named Ramakrishna or Thakur, and he gave this idea to me, it occurred to me one day when I was standing there ordering my cup of coffee that he was offering it to me, that he was serving me. And I saw it was a woman standing behind the counter. And I remember just consciously looking in her eyes to see him in there to see the divinity that was behind her personality, behind her sexuality, behind her, her body or her being, to look for his eyes and to see them looking at me and to have that moment of connection with the beloved, to have that moment of, of recognition of that mutual divinity that we shared. And in that, to have a moment change from mundane, from mundane to profound to have a, a, a meaningless interaction with another human being become an interaction of, of not compassion, in, but a demonstration of love. And to see how that person reacted when I saw for a second or thought I caught a glimpse of Takur looking out, you know, I was actually for a second able to get past that facade and to see that smile and to recognize that humanity that was there behind all of those different veils of presentation. That that was the second most important thing that Vivekananda wanted for India to give to the world. It's what thousands of generations of your families have worked and, and toiled to bring forward with an immense responsibility uh, to, 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 to me, to, to the rest of the world. It's the thing that the whole world is actually looking to you for at this point. It may not recognize it, even we or you may not recognize that, but that's the need of the hour. And it doesn't have to do with, with uh, so much a culture or even a nation, because these truths came before that culture and before that nation. The rishis that, that existed, that, that, that found these truths, that, that did the, the work and the, the, the sacrifice and, and the tapasya to have these truths revealed to them, who were they? They're my ancestors as much as they're your ancestors, are they not? If I go back 15,000 years, where is America? Where is Europe? Where is Russia? Where is China? If you go back 20,000 years, where are we? We're all huddled together in the basket of India or the Euphrates Valley, you know. We're all there together as one people. And it's our rishis that came up with these truths, that, that understood the nature of themselves, the nature of this experience of life. Where my debt is owed to you is, is to the responsibility of the nation that saw the value and has protected those truths, has honored those truths, and has propagated those truths for 10, 12, 15,000 years, while the group of people that I ran off with to end up in Europe forgot all about them, left them behind, and were left in a state of confusion and wonder as to what this universe is and what this world is. So it's a celebration of that. Vivekananda wanted you to remind the world of that oneness, the oneness of the religious effort, that all of us seek that one truth, that understanding of what it is to be human, to be alive, to live a day, and the understanding of who it is that is living that day, that commonality, that oneness that we can look and see in each other's eyes, and find that delight, give profundity back to the normalcy of an everyday. But how does this not become diluted? If we see the whole world as one and we recognize everything as truth, what is it? Where is the uniqueness in it? What, what will preserve this identity? What is it to be a Hindu? You know, I read that, uh, that uh, sheet that uh, was there when I uh, came in on, on who is a Hindu. And it's delightfully Hindu from a Western perspective because I read it and I found at least three contradictory uh, statements <laughs> about what it is to be Hindu, and then the very last paragraph says, well, basically everybody's a Hindu, and none of the other things really apply. It's just a matter of being human, being love, 
you know, manifesting the divine, and to live, to live consciously. And that is delightful to me. It is delightful to me. It is Hinduism that has taught me to hold two contradictory ideas in my mind simultaneously and to not be too worried about it, not stress out about it, because God is bigger, God is greater, and truth is broader than anything I can imagine or understand at the end of the day. In his Chicago address, Vivekananda says, the seed is put in the ground. The earth and air and water are placed around it. Does the seed become the earth, the air, the water? No. It, of course, becomes a plant. It develops after the law of its own growth, assimilates the air, assimilates the earth, assimilates the water, converts them into plant substance and grows into a plant. Similar is the case with religion. The Christian is not to become a Hindu nor a Buddhist, nor a Hindu a Buddhist, to become a Christian. But each must assimilate the spirit of the others, and yet preserve his individuality, to grow according to his own law of growth. So we each are set with this responsibility to assimilate the truth from each other, to assimilate that God nature from each other, to assimilate wisdom that is stronger in one than another and to grow according to our own laws of growth, which are really out of our hands, except for our shaping of the moment, you know, our karmas and whatnots that are plays, those things that, that, that grew me up here in this country or grew you up in another country, those incidentals, you know, that are there, to take those and use those for, toward your realization, toward your understanding. He writes a letter, and he titles it, To My Brave Boys, in which he talks about what is it that you have to know for sure about yourself in order to properly assimilate the activities of the day, to properly assimilate uh, the lessons you learn from the people around you? The primary thing, of course, is love. He says nothing else is necessary but these. Love, sincerity, and patience. What is life but growth, expansion, love? Therefore, all love is life. It is the only law of life. All selfishness is death, and this is true here or hereafter. For none lives, my boys, but he who loves. Feel, my children. Feel for the poor. Feel for the ignorant. Feel for the downtrodden. Feel till the heart stops, the brain reels, and you think you will go mad, and then pour yourself out at the feet of the Lord. Then will come power. Then will come help and an indomitable spirit and energy. Struggle. It is love that pays. It is character that cleaves its way through the adamantine walls of difficulty. I read uh, in, in the brochure, not the brochure, but the flyer that went out about this uh, event today, as I was kind of scratching, trying to find out what it was I was getting involved in. And one of the things it said at the bottom was it said, you know, how will our youth uh, defend their Hinduism when it's challenged? And, uh, I, you know, I was really on board through the whole flyer until I got to that, and then I thought, God, I don't understand, I don't understand that question. Because Hinduism to me is the manifestation of love. It has taught me the purest ideal of love that I've ever seen. And I thought, love doesn't need to be defended. Truth doesn't need to be defended. It's self-evident. If you love, that's your responsibility. You never have to defend an act of love. You never have to defend an act of compassion an act of encouragement. If someone attacks your religion, step aside and look at theirs and ask them what they like about theirs, what they find encouraging about theirs, and get them talking about what fills them up in theirs. And put your arm around them and sit next to them and appreciate because you're Hindu. You can do that. They cannot. That is the strength of Hinduism. That is the strength of Islam. That is the unity that Vivekananda has given you the responsibility to deliver to the world at large through the way that you live, the way that you love. He says, secondly, there cannot be any growth without liberty. Our ancestors freed religious thought and we have a wonderful religion, but they put a heavy chain on the feet of society and our society is, in a word, horrid, diabolical. In the West, society always had freedom, and look at them. On the other hand, look at their religion. Liberty is the first condition of growth. Just as man must have liberty to think and speak, 
so he must have liberty in food, dress, and marriage, and in every other thing, so long as he does not injure others. So all of this, all of this environment of love, this environment of acceptance, this environment of growth, has to be given the respect of liberty. You have to give yourself that freedom to express, and to seek out, and to look for new ideas, new ideals, new presentations of an infinite self, you know, I think particularly of, of your kids, you know, which this is such a, a delicate place for me to step, and I wasn't going to step here at all, but here I am already in the middle of it. Um, you know, this, this challenge of growing up in, in Western culture as an Indian child, you know, I've been around the centers for about 20 years, I've seen a lot of kids grow up, and I've seen a lot of uh, Indian kids really struggle with identity and where they belong, and how they express, because their, their, their parents, and the, the few that I'm thinking about at the moment, their parents were Indian and fresh from India, and were trying to establish an Indian environment that was as big as their house for them to grow up in, and then sending them to school, which was radically different for those kids. And the struggles that they came to me after I, you know, in the monastery, would hear a lot of their, they'd come for advice, they'd like, what do I do, and how do I, the stress and the anguish that they felt at the two poles of these different worlds and, and not having any means of bringing them together, you know, not having any means of finding the truth in that. And uh, I hurt for that because I think that this liberty is, is the answer to that. You know, they have to know that love, they have to know that acceptance, they have to know that bigness of the self, they have to recognize that oneness uh, in, in all people, but then they have to be given the unit, the, the liberty to express that in a very different way, in a very new way, through a whole different set of, 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 of activities, perhaps. And that uh, uh, us as teachers, and us as parents, and, and us as, as, as people that they respect, have to give them that space and take a chance, take a risk. Liberty always comes with a great deal of risk. But if you feed that love, if you feed that notion of oneness, and establish that as your groundwork, you will find an amazing amount of beauty develop. We just finished a three-week summer camp at the Vedanta Center over on Belpre, and I have to say it's one of the highlights, it is the highlight, I can actually probably say at this point, of my spiritual life so far. For the last three weeks I've been with uh, 25 uh, Hindu kids, and I have never before seen a group of kids be more kind, be more supportive, uh, be more friendly toward one another than this group of kids. I didn't see any of the standard uh, name calling. I didn't see any of the standard, you know, uh, breaking off into groups and pointing fingers and whatnot like that. And I thought, this is the beauty of Vedanta. This is the beauty of Vedanta, that we can bring a group of 25 kids together from all over the country. Uh, more than half of them traveled to, to spend the three weeks at the center. But to have them, this disparate group of people, to come together and find such a beautiful uh, expression uh, of love and, and unity, so that there was huge weeping in the parking lot on Friday night when uh, they all had to go their separate ways. <laughs> that lasted long after I left the parking lot. So we have to dive in and we have to dive deep because none of this comes easily. Our responsibility, your responsibility, my responsibility. You know, we talk in terms of countries, and we talk in terms of cultures, and we talk in terms of world, and we talk in terms of ancient and modern. But when it comes down to it, it's just right now. It's just me, it's just you, individually in our chair, in our own worlds. And the responsibility is on you to realize your unity with everyone around you. And in that unity, to find the courage to reach out to everyone around you and to encourage everyone around you, to be a servant to the people around you, to find out what they need and to look for a way to fill that need. And that's done through practice. That's done through the hard, the hard discipline of just sitting there and thinking of the divine, studying the scriptures to find the divine, taking a serious look at, at, at your, your own self and find out what your delusions are about your, your nature and your existence. And then to delight to delight in love. Looking upon all beings as your own self, should this idea be confined to books alone? 
How will they grant salvation who cannot feed a hungry mouth with a crumb of bread? How will those who become impure at a mere breath of others purify others? Don't touch ism as a form of a mental disease. Beware. All expansion is life. All contraction is death. All love is expansion. All selfishness is contraction. Love is, therefore, the only law of life. He who loves lives. He who is selfish is dying. Therefore, love for love's sake, because it is the only law of life, just as you breathe to live. This is the secret of selfless love, selfless action, and all the rest.